Hello, everybody. Welcome to the secret history of living in your aquarium. Today we have aquariums. We have history. We have secrets. Well, they're not that big of secrets, but uh, they they may be new information to you. And if you want to breed Corydora catfish um, and other uh, equatorial species of freshwater fish, this is information that'll really help you. And we're going to show you all in this video uh, the different stages of the catfish being raised also. I've got everything from eggs to eggs that hatch this morning to these fish that will be spawning this afternoon. And I'm going to tell you how I can control that and what's going on. So now there are about 850 known species of Corydora catfish. It's a lot of species. They're kind of similar into plecos um, or loaches in the way that they, they spawn and breed. They are somewhat egg scatterers, but they tend to leave them in clusters more so than scattering them completely randomly. Usually you'll see um, uh, that they'll leave maybe 50 here and maybe another 50 on this leaf. They like flat surfaces that are clean of uh, algae or mold or fungi. They want a clean surface so their eggs don't rot. And uh, that's, that's kind of what they demand as far as in the tank setup. Now, a lot of quarries also enjoy sand. So certain Corydoras, not these ones here, these are Venezuelas Corydoras. And then we also have Hebrosis Corydoras. The Venezuelas, Corydora Venezuelas, are from, let me, I'll, I'll give you guys one guess. Yeah, Venezuela. Okay, so they're from Venezuela, and uh, they don't lay eggs right in the sand like some other, uh, like Trilineatus or Babalti. Some Corydoras, though, do prefer to lay eggs right in the sand. Now, they don't need a spawning cave. They don't need anything special like that. They just need... Uh, males and females, and if you have a group of six Corydoras, which is a great number just because it keeps, uh, it keeps them from being lonely and they start to act as a shoal, and that means like they start to behave in a schooling uh, manner rather than just aimlessly kind of darting around and hiding in corners and just kind of being shy. So you get a lot more uh, very interesting activity. And as you guys have probably seen on this channel before, when you trigger them to spawn, they will start acting a very specific way and give you probably 30 minutes to even a day's warning that eggs are coming. And you'll just have to keep an eye on it and figure out your fish, uh, what you did, and you know how long of a, a warning that usually gives you in your case. But let's take this over to my taller tank where we've got some uh, panda corridors and some trilineatus corridors. Right here we have the black Venezuelas cori. So we've got orange and black Venezuelas coris in here, and I just fed them bloodworms. And just like I did, I did the same in the other tank. In this tank, there has been no water change uh, for a little while, but what I do is I wait and watch the weather if possible. I wait and watch the weather. Now here is the, the tip, the secret uh, that sometimes old time fish keepers will tell you, um, and you'll, you might find it online, but a lot of times you have to kind of dig and they don't make a point of telling you just how effective it is. So the biggest thing you can do for Corydoras same with rainbow fish. The, same, the biggest thing you can do is you let the water get warm. You let it get to, say, 80 degrees, and you let it evaporate off. If you have lids, you can take them off for a couple days, especially if we're just talking quarries in a spawning tank. They do like plants, but they're not necessary. Um, you do want to give them some hiding spot like a log or rock, somewhere to hide behind, just so they feel comfortable. They can have a spot to relax in between uh, the activity you're going to see. So you let it evaporate off. You let the heat increase. You let the TDS increase. That's total dissolved solids. That's little things floating around in the water. And naturally, that's going to be going up as the water evaporates off and no new water is added. So you'd have to add distilled water to keep it even at equilibrium uh, once it evaporates off. But with the TDS 
you know, say you had 500 parts per million in this tank and this much evaporates, you have 500 parts per million, but now it's in less water, so it's 750 parts per million. And the fish can tell this, they can feel it. And you can let that naturally occur over two weeks or so and let the heat be around 80 degrees. And then what you do is you wait for, if, if you live in an area where this is frequent, like I do, Seattle or the UK or the Northeast, you could, or even Florida or something, you wait for a low pressure front. So what is that? Well, you can check the weather channel and they'll tell you when a low pressure front's coming in. About an hour or two before the low pressure front hits your town, start feeding your fish live baby brine shrimp, black worms, uh, blood worms, whatever it may be, micro worms, whatever their favorite treat is, Daphnia, um, Corridors tend to, they, they're omnivorous, but they tend to like uh, meat, and before they spawn, they really want protein. So what this is doing is this is simulating, you know, right before a storm, the humidity goes way up, and what happens, you see these Venezuela's corys with the plecos and the corridor hebrosis, the little teeny ones, um, maybe we won't hop to the other tank since they've decided to come and be cooperative now, uh, but... When the TDS goes up, it shows them that the wet season is coming because it's summer. It's dried out. Their watering holes are shrinking. They can feel the pressure. The weight of water is much heavier than air. And they feel that in the sensors in their lateral line that most fish have, this little line that runs across a lot of catfish and a lot of fish in general. And they can sense that in there and in their inner ear and it tells them how much water is above them, you know, if it's gone up or down. And instinctually, they'll leave regions if they can sense that there's a flow of water or fresh water coming from one direction. They'll follow that a lot of times uh, back up the source. So they don't, don't think they don't have the capability to know all of this. They're very, very uh, evolved, complex creatures. And so... You let that happen, you let the TDS drop, you let them feed, and you give them all that high-protein, good, fresh food, and then what do you do? Right as the low comes in, as you can see it's starting to rain, or you can smell the rain coming into your neighborhood uh, outside, you change the water. You change it 50%. You know, you top it back off so it's high. You can increase the flow in your tank. You can turn up a power head, turn it on if you have one that wasn't on. And this is going to just spark all sorts of activity in the Corridoras. They love the fresh water after you just fed them protein. If you really want to kick it off, what you can do is you can also separate the males and females, which is a little harder with Corridoras. Basically, the females tend to have more of a pronounced belly right here, up in the front there. Uh, and Usually the males tend to have more color and the females are a little more washed out, but um, it's not foolproof and the onodontodes or the little whiskers are a little bigger. Uh, but in any case, you got the water, you've rinsed it out and uh, in the tank and you've dropped that TDS. What happens is adding all that extra water in that weight, it tells them it's the rainy season. If I lay eggs right now, they're going to spill out over my little pond or my section of the river and they're going to rot, wash downstream and my species will proliferate and you know life will find a way and so that's what they're going to do and what will happen is you'll see them in an aquarium they'll start swimming up and down up and down and you'll see them form what we call the t position i have a whole video on them doing that but you can see when they swim up, they'll headbutt one another in the bellies and they, they kind of chase each other and they get really active and then they do this little headbutt in each other's belly and that's, that's their kind of mating ritual. And after they start doing that, you know for sure they're going to be laying eggs almost without fail somewhere in the tank, so get ready. And you can strategically kind of prep that by leaving spots on the glass open and maybe having rough texture or fine leaf plants, you know, in the center and then having some bigger leaf plants like they'll lay without fail on these big uh, Lagonandrumi boldae or the um, Anubius or the sword ferns, that sort of thing. So 
That's how you get them to spawn. Now, you can take your chances, and sometimes little babies just will survive no matter what you have. If you have gouramis, angelfish, sometimes they'll survive if you've got enough cover. I mean, there's a hundred little eggs, they may survive. But if you don't want to chance it, if you want to breed for profit, if you want to breed for uh, lots of the fish, then what you're going to do is you're going to gently take your hand. When you find the eggs, they're going to be on the glass, and you're just going to kind of roll very, very carefully. And you'll get a container, like a glass jar, put it under water, and you're just going to roll the egg uh, right into, without hardly any pressure, just friction, and you roll it up and put it into the little jar, and you do that with a little group of them at a time. And if the eggs are stark white, that means that they're rotting, they've molded. If they're clear or kind of an amberish yellow color, then you're golden. Get it? You're golden. So that's a good way to remember it. If they're golden, you're golden, and they're still uh, incubating. Now, they can take anywhere between 48 hours all the way up to six days, but most of the time they're going to be in that three to four day window and they'll hatch you need to keep them warm at least over 72 degrees but like i said when you put that fresh water in you drop the temperature because remember rain is not hot it may be warm but it's not as hot as the water that's had sun beating down on it all day long in the jungle so you can drop it by as much as 10 degrees what you're putting in and if that's less than 50%, then it should only change the temperature by 5 degrees Fahrenheit or 2.5 degrees Celsius. And that should be plenty. Some people go to more extremes. I don't think it's necessary. I think it can stress the fish sometimes. There are species like the uh, Panda Corridora um, of Colombia, not the high fin one or the new one, but the oldest type. Uh, that does tolerate all the way down to like 60 in the 60 degrees. But that's just, you know, that's an exception to the rule. So let's go downstairs, finish this video off, bring it on home. I'll show you what the brand stinking new babies look like and uh, of these Venezuela's Corridoras and Hebrosis Corridoras. Uh, and we will bring it on home. So I will see you downstairs with the magic of editing in just a... Oh, sec. So, whew. That was hard to travel through time like that. All right, so let's let's take a look at the hatching situation. So I told you about the jar. It's a magical jar. How do I keep it at temperature? Well, it's pretty easy. I just leave it in an aquarium that is full of other fish like Corydoras and angelfish and things. Um, you have to be a little careful if you have some really uh, overly... Uh, gung-ho fish they could jump in I suppose or shrimp shrimp sometimes do get in when you're floating it low to the water level but they'll clean things they won't harm anything most of the time so we're going to use natural light right here to just take a look at what is going on let me scoot this stuff aside guys and in here we have little teeny eggs and I'm guessing they've hatched you're going to find out with me right now or I'm going to look like a fool. So there's an egg. See the little yellow egg? And there are some brand new Corydoras. Corydora the Explora. And so what is this blue stuff in the water? Well, that's methylene blue. It is a dye that uh, is actually an antifungal. And that's why I didn't need to put an air stone or use a egg tumbler or anything fancy like that. You can literally use a jar as long as it's warm enough. And uh, you just take a toothpick uh, and dip it in the methylene blue a couple times. And that's it. So you can see here we've got the baby corridors. These literally had to have hatched in the last three hours, four hours. They still have egg on them <laughs> they, and they have yolks. So you can see some of them are less formed than others, these ones here. And some are going to be stillborn, and some are not going to be as um, spunky as others. But they will, uh, they will grow at different rates, and eventually they'll all be ready uh, to... Wow, my fish would have been really excited if these weren't in a blister pack to have 24 O-nip tabs at once. So then, what do they look like? A couple days after they hatch. Well, we've got an aquarium that actually has about five weeks of hatching going on in here. So let's show that off. All right. So right here we have the Corridori, Corridori, Corridora hebrosis. 
So this is that little guy, and you can see that he's got his little whiskers, he's starting to get his salt and pepper corridor a look, that's what he is. And then uh, we also have the Venezuelas ones, and if we can find them, we have little teeny shrimp in here, and we have plecos, and we have, uh, we have Madaka rice fish, and we have shrimp and snails. What a community, right? Well, you can raise all these little critters together. Um, once, they're, once they're in that methylene blue, you want to get them out of there as soon as they hatch into fish because it is semi-toxic. Um, while it kills fungi, it can kill fish. Uh, yikes. So it can do that. Um, now, here is a little Venezuela's Corridora, and it is a little different. You can see it's not so spotty, and it will develop. Corridoras actually have a really interesting development process um, where they have the ability to gulp air and things and that is a trait that was kept from the fish world way 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 back in time and so you can see on some of these corridoras uh, they still look rather juvenile here's another one of the venezuelas where you can actually see some red coming in and you can see the black striped by the eyes forming. I'm sorry if that's so blurry, guys, but they're they're real teeny. Um, that one's probably two millimeters long, and the one down here is probably three, three or four millimeters long. Uh, and then let's hop down and see the oldest ones that are growing up, and they're hanging out. And you can see here that color change that I was discussing. See that? You can see the orange starting to form right there. So, that is your beautiful little baby Corydora, and all you need to do is feed them, well, you can see in this shrimp tank, there's all sorts of little bugs and white dots that are running around, and that's what they're eating. You can see that drifting. Um, in this one, you can really see his like little um, gill and the organ that does his balance and inner ear and pressure those little dots they're going to disappear um and they're not going to bug the baby shrimp in here so i put them in here and just let them be free there's another one back in here that's a week younger than these ones and you can see it doesn't have much color yet like that one up above and so just let them roam and for the next few months they're going to grow out and they're going to grow out and get bigger and bigger and cuter and cuter and uh, within about three months, they should be able to go back, maybe even two months, they should be able to go back with the adults. It's really once they start to get to this stage and they start to look like an adult Corridora that you know you're, you're where you need to be. So I've been able to keep it right here in this Blue Dream tank. Uh, and this is where they will be until they grow out to about half an inch. And they're almost there. They're probably at half an inch of length. Uh, a few of these, but I'll be pulling them out just every day I check, and I'll pull out a couple that are up to size and put them back upstairs with the parents. And that's all there is to it. Um, I feed them, uh, I try to feed them live uh, food, like vinegar eels when they're real small, like up here, and daphnia and brine shrimp. And I've got links to all that stuff, how to hatch that um, down below, as well as if you search my videos, you can find out how to do that. And that is the useful skill and ability to have for all sorts of fish, not just Corydoras. But Corydoras are a great entry level fish to try spawning. Uh, I'd say Plecos, Crebenzis, um, Epistogrammas, uh, and, uh, and those sort of things. They're all angelfish too. They're all good entry-level fish, angelfish being a little bit harder because more of the eggs rot, whereas Corydoras have a very tough little membrane on their eggs, and so most of the eggs survive even if you've got water that's prone to, to uh, liquid rot and stuff like that with the fungi. All right, guys, so that's basically it. I like to give them fresh catapa leaves and some algae. I like to keep the water at around a TDS of 200 or 100 keeps it similar to the wet season, like when they would be growing out. I like giving them the fresh food, but then I start to transition them. Once they're starting to get the size that they have uh, any color or markings rather than just little tadpoles, um, that's when I'll start giving them 
uh, crushed flake food or something like this, aquarium co-op easy fry food, um, and then vinegar eels once a day and micro worms once a day usually. That's the usual routine for the whole tank of all these young fry critters. And uh, the water, like I said, it's going to be about 78 degrees at the warmest, 76 at the coolest. I like to keep it around 78, 77. So that's where I keep it for most of these fish. Um, and then same with down here, 76, 77, something like that. And the TDS is very low. Uh, close to neutral pH, maybe like 6.8 to 7.5 would be a good range. You don't want it to be over eight, really, um, for most species of the quarries. And you don't want it to be too crazy low um, just because it, it gets easier to mess up different parameters in the tank unless you're really well-versed in black water tanks. Uh, here you can see even some really teeny ones that still are sticky and stick to the glass that I got out of the jar last night. So they cruise around almost looking like any other little fish and blend in and there's no way to tell them apart until uh, about two weeks in when they start looking like this and getting their different markings. So you can see the little Hebrosis and the little Venezuelas. So... That's that. Um, I hope you guys, this was helpful, helps you uh, see the different stages and uh, think about how you want to set up your tanks. Uh, it's really easy to do this. You can leave your Corydoras in the community tank and just have one hatch tank for a bunch of different species like I do. If this was helpful, please go ahead and like it. Subscribe if you'd like to see more of this or learn more info on this kind of stuff. And... Uh, this channel is full of it, and if you want to support the school of these lovely fish in all of my tanks and the content I bring to you on their behalf, uh, you can support this school going to university uh, by checking me out on Patreon, and even like a buck really helps uh, keep the fish room fed, the lights on, and new and exciting things coming in. Uh, so thank you so much. I hope I've earned your view, and I will talk to you later. Le letter. I will talk to you later. All right, guys, take it easy. And next up, angelfish. Bye.